Um, so we have a bet on whether I can keep the camera guy busy or not. So I'm going to be walking lots of back and forth just to make sure that he's not bored because we don't like camera, bored camera guys. Um, my name is Brandon Schell. Uh, this is uh, Notes from the Field. I, I've been speaking at Bright Forum for uh, several years. Uh, this is obviously the second time in London since this is only the second time in London. But prior to that, I've done uh, several shows in Chicago. Um, I typically do a PowerShell 101 uh, class uh, or session or whatever you want to call it. But this year, I asked Brian and then was like, well, I, I would like to kind of take you know, the 101. Uh, I love it, and I like to do that particular session. But um, it, PowerShell's been around long enough now. I, I would hope that uh, most people have at least some elementary knowledge of it. Uh, and what I would like to do is kind of build on that knowledge and give you some practical ways to use PowerShell on a day-to-day -day basis from a, a business uh, objective type perspective. Like, how do I use PowerShell to uh, do more stuff at work, to make my job at work easier, and stuff like that. Um, again, Brendan Shell, that's my, uh, my Twitter thing. I used to blog, but Twitter killed my blog. Um, which actually, no, Brian Madden killed my blog because he got me on Twitter. So I blame Brian for my blog's death. Um, I do blog like once a year. <laughs> but I do have a blog. It's uh, bslposh.com. Um, before I go too much into this, um, I do want to get kind of a, first of all, I mean, I'm sure you hear this all the time. I'm very interactive. I don't like to just sit here and yeah, you know, drone on. Uh, I can drone on if you want. Uh, I can rabbit trail and do all kinds of really cool tricks. Um, <laughs> but ideally, uh, it works well if there's uh, back and forth in, in conversation. Because as we start talking about stuff, you may bring up something that someone else is already thinking, or you may uh, think about something that I haven't thought about, which is uh, highly likely. Uh, and it would be nice to capture that. Um, how many of you use PowerShell? Uh, I've used PowerShell, I guess. Hopefully, everyone's hands go up there, right? Uh, how many of you use it frequently, like daily? Uh, what do you use it for? Just like uh, for what? Specific Zen Desktop, Zen App, a particular yeah, platform? Actually, so a lot of Zen App. Zen App definitely Anyone else? Anyone outside of that does uses it outside of Zen App or Zen Desktop? Uh, I heard exchange. Exchange? Uh, ooh. <laughs> Shivers. Actually, Link is not a bad product. I just, it's one of those things where they, uh, they share pointed it, is what I call it. You know, it, it had, in the very beginning, it had focus, it had a reason for being, and then they messed with it. And now it does everything and nothing. <laughs> or, well, it doesn't do anything well, but it does a lot of stuff. I, I know how. To, sorry, I, I apologize. Hopefully, PowerShell makes that a little less painful. But anyway, um, so we have people that use it for Exchange, Link, uh, Exchange, uh, Zen App, Zen Desktop. Anything else? Just like normal day-to-day -day kind of life, right? Um, so the overview or the purpose of this particular um, session, what I wanted to kind of get across, is I want to talk about some kind of core things. Uh, fundamental uh, things that I think that you need to get right for you to be able to build a, uh, a platform, effectively a platform at your place of work, or if you go and do consulting at your customers' places of work, uh, some of the things you need to do to get it done right. right? Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about coding practices. Um, not, too much on back, uh, not too much on the actual coding itself, because, I mean, those are... You know, opinions are like trash cans. Everyone has one. They all stink, right? It's kind of thing. Uh, I, I don't want to get into opinionated code, but there are some kind of rules of thumbs or very specific things that you should not do and very specific things that you should do, just as just general coding practices. Rather, you want to use camel case or, or all those other things. Those are all kind of superfluary. They have really no bearing on whether the code is readable or not. Um, but we're going to talk about coding practices. Uh, we're going to talk about environment, how to set up a PowerShell environment to be useful. Um, I think one of the biggest things, um, you know, because I've been a PowerShell MVP 
I, I think I'm going on my sixth year. Um, so I've been using PowerShell since early beta. Um, I've always kind of been very passionate about it. It's like one of my favorite things in the world, uh, right next to my wife. <laughs> this is not being recorded, right? No. Um, anyway, I, I, everyone knows me. That I'm, I'm very, I, I, PowerShell, this is going to sound ridiculous, but it changed my life um, from, a, uh, from a business perspective or from a job perspective. Um, prior to PowerShell, I was probably doing 80% ops work, so crap work, the stuff that nobody likes to do except for these very special people, um, and then 20% of the fun work, project work, doing new stuff, learning new stuff, the, stuff, the whole reason why we enjoy technology. I hope most of you enjoy technology. But for the people that enjoy technology, they're, what kind of keeps us going, what drives our passion for what we do is that uh, there's project works so or getting those new things done. Um, so before PowerShell, I was doing like 80-20. So I wasn't a very happy employee in regards to, I wasn't, my, my, job, from the, my job fulfillment didn't feel very good, right? Because I was doing way more crap work and a lot less fun work. Uh, once I started learning PowerShell, I was able to shift that almost in half, like almost flip, to where I was able to do 80% project work and 20% crap work, right? And the reason why I was able to do that was because I was able to automate. And a lot of the tasks, I, you know, all the clicking and all the stuff I kept doing over and over again, I'm like, you know what? I'll spend a little bit extra time this time, write a script to do it, and then I never have to do it again, right? That's awesome, right? Uh, and I think that's uh, PowerShell did that for me. And because it, it really changed the way that I work and was able to you know, increase my job satisfaction, I'm probably a little bit more. Uh, zealotry than most people, more zeal, more whatever you want to call them. I'm crazy. Um, so I also wanted to give you some project, uh, PowerShell project ideas, some I stuff that you could probably uh, go straight home uh, and work on building at, at, at your office and get some immediate value um, out of PowerShell. Um, and then um, I have a little scenario. Um, at a company I used to, I, I work for um, Splunk now. Uh, so I'm not really doing IT. I'm not doing your kind of work anymore. Um, I've moved over to the, the annoying sales. I don't do sales, but I'm, I'm a software company now. I work for a software company now, so all that stuff's supposed to be important to me. <laughs> I still like this stuff, but I, you know, I do the other stuff for day, my day job. Uh, but I have a really cool scenario, uh, what I consider a really cool scenario that, um, that I want to talk you through on how what we did at the, the company that I worked at prior uh, on how we used PowerShell to um, provide a lot of efficiencies inside of our company. Before I go any further, any questions? You want to start over? <laughs> uh, so coding practices. Um, I just kind of blunt these as coding practices. I mean, so if any of you are actually developers, you're going to be like, that's not coding practices. I understand that. This is just, I had to put it on a slide. <laughs> so, this is what we call coding practices. Um, ideally, uh, when you talk about PowerShell, you want to have um, simple repositories. So, actually, before I go too farther, too much far, uh, too far, too much farther down this road, um, I want to explain why I do a lot of these things. Um, you may have caught the PowerShell bug, and you may really enjoy PowerShell. Uh, some people use it because they have to. Some people use it because they want to. Right? It's, it's just different approaches, but they're, they're both valid. Um, the way that I approached it is because I enjoyed it so much, I obviously wanted to share this joy with everybody. And, and then, so I was the annoying guy in the office that went around and said, use PowerShell, use PowerShell, because people hated me. But um, one of the things I did strive, or one of the things I learned, was if I made it easy right, and accessible and consistent, I had a much higher ratio of people picking up PowerShell and kind of getting the, the bug themselves or getting the uh, passion themselves. So a lot of these practices are all about just making it simple for people that don't want to know PowerShell, right? They want what PowerShell can give them, but they don't really want to know PowerShell, right? They're like, you know what? I got enough stuff going on. Don't need anything else. If this will make my life easier, I'm all for it. I don't want to learn anything new, right? And a lot of you might be in that camp, and that's fine. Uh, these are things that you can do to set up, that you can set up to make this something 
that is much easier, you know, something that you don't have to think about. You can start up a PowerShell prompt or even start up a GUI that uses PowerShell underneath and not know all the stuff that's going on in the background. Does that make sense? So central repository. Having a single place uh, that you, need, you can go to to find uh, modules, uh, scripts, uh, and that kind of stuff is really key. Uh, no one likes to go searching for stuff. Well, that's not true. There's people that do that for a living. But generally speaking, people don't like to go search for scripts. If they want to, you know, if you had a, you know, get uh, my company file script, right? They don't want to, you know, they, it's like they know the script that they want, but they don't know where to find it. That is very irritating, and that is going to lower your adoption rate. People are not going to be happy about that. So the idea is to have a central repository. Um, I, what, the way we did it is we created a, a DFS share. Um, called PowerShell, and then underneath that we had a profile share, a module share, and a script share. With obviously, the modules would contain all the modules that our company supported. The script would be uh, all the scripts, and the profile, our user profiles. Now these are not uh, the, God forbid, profiles that we have grown to hate in the terminal server slash BDI world. Uh, these are PowerShell profiles, so they're good. Although I imagine sometime in the future we'll have the same issues with these profiles as we do with regular profiles. But as of right now, that is not an issue. So. Uh, a naming scheme. Um, PowerShell, the, the guys that designed PowerShell um, went out of their way to um, invest the time and energy to come up with a naming scheme that is, makes PowerShell easily, easy to discover, right? So um, uh, it's not necessarily intuitive straight off the bat, but once you understand the naming scheme of uh, verb noun, uh, it's easy for you to try to figure out what you want to do. Uh, so if you know that uh, the PowerShell verbiage is verb noun, uh, and you know that get is a valid verb, right? that's the verb that you want to use, if I asked you to go uh, get me services, what would you type? Right? Get dash service. It just kind of makes sense. Uh, not only that, when you have a pipeline or, or a list of commands, um, you can uh, you can read it almost like uh, American English, <laughs> so it's broken and not consistent and a whole bunch of slang, but uh, American English nonetheless. So uh, not so much British English because y'all do it right. But um, in any case, it, it's a very easy for you to like get command. You know, get service where service equals blah, you know, set service blah. You can, so you can write that command, uh, and my wife could read that without having to know anything about PowerShell. It was just very easy to follow. She may not know what's going on, but she could read it and kind of get an idea. So uh, coming up with a naming scheme inside of your company is also very important, or trying to enforce the PowerShell naming scheme is, all, is very important. So you'll, have, so you'll have people in your company that are consumers, uh, and I say, when I say company, it could also be, if you're a consultant, it could be companies that you go to. Um, they're going to be people that are going to be consumers of PowerShell. They're not going to care, right? They don't want it. They're not going to write code. They're going to use what you give them, and that's it. For those guys, the naming uh, scheme is probably far more important because they want consistency. They, they don't want to guess. They don't want to try to figure stuff out. Um, from the Writer's perspective, this is where you have to do enforce that. So when you have people in your company that are actually writing tools for your customers to consume, you need to make sure that they go by the naming scheme. Right? Um, under naming scheme, I've also broke down functional task base. So um, PowerShell works. Uh, so I, a tendency for a lot of scripts. So how many of you have actually come from scripting background like, or, or developing me? background. Are you all like IT pro but never did script? So a lot of you done scripting, right? So PowerShell scripting is not like VB scripting. It's not like Python scripting, right? Those are all, you know, very encompassing long scripts that do a lot of different stuff. Um, when you write functions or write scripts in PowerShell, I tend to try to make them as black box as possible, right? They expect, they, they take one piece of input or one type of input and they output one piece of, uh, one type of data, right? So uh, if I have something that says get service, uh, I pass it a string of the service name that I want to get, and out comes a service, right? There's no, I'm not going to get a file system object from get service, 
right? Um, and that's something that you really want to, when you're going through this process through your developers or the guy that's going to be writing scripts, you need to be very clear. Look, you need to have a single type that comes from your commandlet or your, your function. Do not pass out a bunch of stuff because it's not consistent um, and it's hard to program against long term. Right? Does that make sense? Everyone got what I'm saying? Um, so having your functions be very task-based, say, hey, look, if you have a, a workflow that you want to write down in a script, ideally is to write functions that do each part of the workflow, and then you can kind of have like a master script that calls each one of the, that kind of processes the workflow. Um, actually, in PowerShell v3, uh, they've actually introduced workflows so that you can actually write workflows now instead of, um, so instead of it being a script, it's a workflow. And the difference is, is that workflows can stop, they can start, uh, they can be restarted, uh, and they can be like, so you can have a workflow that uh, installs some applications, restarts the box, and then when the box comes back, the, the workflow continues, does a lot of other stuff, restarts the box. So workflow is just that. It's a workflow, it's a process, not necessarily a script. Does that make sense? Um, so variables, uh, you know, naming your variables properly or having some kind of variable um, uh, naming scheme is important. Uh, it's not probably my most important thing on here, uh, but I, I do try to keep uh, my variables um, well, uh, you know, consistent so that if, if you're accessing the variable from the command line, right? So this isn't so much, um, this isn't so much in the script itself, uh, but if you're populating uh, your PowerShell scope, and you have variables that you're exposing in that scope, uh, you want to make sure that you don't collide with other variables and all that kind of stuff. Um, has anyone heard of a CAC before? No? Um, this is a concept that Microsoft has actually implements uh, in all their product lines. Uh, and it's basically a set of criteria that uh, if, if Microsoft is going to release a product, and that, my, that product is going to have a Microsoft label on it, or in the, like in a specific case of server. Like if it's going to be a Microsoft server product, it must meet this criteria, right? It must support MMC. Uh, it must support PowerShell. It, like the whole list of things that they have to support before Microsoft will let them ship that with the Microsoft label on it and server product, right? So that's what a common engineer, common engineering criteria is. Um, why this is important? Um, and your, your business is, again, it's consistency, right? You should define a preset of uh, what are approved verbs. So uh, PowerShell has their list of approved verbs, and ideally, uh, your best scenario is to, to abide by those and to say, hey, look, you cannot write a command line that does not use an approved verb. Uh, there are a lot of scenarios where that doesn't work. You may have uh, business-specific needs that require you to use a verb that's not approved. In those scenarios, what you can do is you can have an extended approved verb list. As long as you have some kind of guidelines that the user doesn't have to guess at what verb you're using, right? The, the naming scheme breaks very fragilely if you start not, if you don't abide by it, right? Or if you did what Citrix did and went back asswards. <laughs> uh, their, their PBS commandlets, they went noun verb. <laughs> Does not work the same. So uh, common engineering criteria, uh, I believe, is uh, fairly important uh, as far as just getting a common goal. And, and, the, and the biggest value here is consistency for your users or your consumers. Um, I, now, I worked, at a, um, I worked at a hedge fund um, uh, in New York City. I, I say hedge fund like y'all know what those are. <laughs> uh, y'all know what hedge funds are? I mean, I know you have similar things. I don't know if they call them the thing, same thing over here. But a hedge fund is just someone that like steals money from people. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Um, so we ha I worked for a hedge fund, uh, which means that we had a lot of money, uh, and we hired really, really uh, smart people. Uh, so this whole process I went through, I went through building basically a um, a support system for our help desk. Uh, now, for a lot of companies, that's probably not uh, that's not applicable. Like I said, most of our uh, most of our help desk guys had like degrees from Yale, Harvard, Princeton, you know, Ivy League type colleges. So they're you're smarter than your average help desk person. Um, 
So I had kind of a luxury there that most people do not have. Um, but even for them, the consistency was very important. I don't think I would have near, I wouldn't have gotten near the adoption that I got uh, internally had I not went through the trouble of setting up uh, this, is, this is what we have to support. If anyone's going to write a commandlet, it has to fit this pattern uh, so that when our help desk guy you know, gets on a phone with a user, uh, you know, that, you know, these users are really important users, right? Uh, he's not you know, fighting for trying to figure out what's going on. He knows exactly, he doesn't have to go discover or look for stuff, right? We had to be able to, to respond very quickly. Um, source control. Uh, I, so I, back in the day uh, when I first go, started down this path, uh, I, I'm like, source control, <laughs> who needs source control, right? It's just a bunch of crap. Uh, it was just more trouble to me than it was worth. I mean, I can, I'm like, if I don't do source control, I can like kick out code all day long. I can change it, and I don't have to worry about checking stuff in. I can just put it in a file share, and stuff just happens. Now you want to do source control. Now I got to check it out. I got to make the changes. Got to check it in. Got to get approved. Got to. Like, this is way too much work. Uh, I don't like this. Uh, you're making me do more work. I don't think we should do it. Uh, but uh, uh, brains prevailed <laughs> instead of my laziness, and we started using source control. Uh, and the first time source control saves your ass, you have a whole new respect <laughs> for source control. Uh, in our particular case, we had a, uh, the shares that you see up here, these were only uh, writable by uh, domain admin. They weren't writable by anybody else. And we had a process that would dump those, uh, those shares out from a, uh, we actually used SVN repository. So the only way that you could get something out to the, to the share, right, was to commit it to source, uh, to get SVN and get the change approved. Once the change is approved, then a nightly batch process would run and copy all those new changes down. In such case that it was an urgent change, we obviously had a process in place to push that a little bit faster. But the idea is that we never once, after we implemented source control, never once had a situation where you know, someone fat fingered a, a text file or fat fingered a script and hosed every machine in our environment. <laughs> Generally, a bad thing to do, right, is to write a script that blows up, you know, 2,000, 3,000 desktops. Uh, that is uh, generally not good on your resume. Um, so source control is very, very important. Uh, we used SVN. Um, currently, I use Git. I like Git. Uh, it's pretty, uh, with the Mac client and now the new Windows client, it's pretty easy to use. Um, we did a nightly sync. Um, do y'all, anyone here use source control of any sort? What do you use? Subversion, anyone else outside of Subversion? No? Oh my gosh. Do you not use, SV you don't use source control at all? Like your scripts are just all in text files? I was there one day. Uh, you'll, you, <laughs> first time, I'm telling you, the first time you get screwed by that, and you'll be like, source control. <laughs> uh, you should probably set that up immediately. Like, um, if your company, in our particular case, our company already had uh, a source control product. They were already using SVN, so it was pretty easy for us just to kind of you know, hop into that, that process. Um, if not, you, you, the good thing is, is if you don't have source control already, uh, you have a gambit of options, um, and it's kind of like a, the, the world is your oyster in regards to picking out which one that you want to do, um, but the problem is, is that you actually have to set it up. <laughs> um, so, anyway, um, the other thing is, uh, I know this is hard to believe, uh, it's, it's a, it's, it's, mind-blowing, but stuff breaks, uh, and it's almost a guarantee that it's going to break at some point. Uh, and when, again, when you're, when, you're, when you're utilizing something like this across your entire environment, right, um, if a script breaks or does something that's not supposed to or starts having a problem, right, this is exponentially, right, it's 3,000 desktops instead of just one, right? We're not talking about a script that I'm going to run on my machine. Right, where if it breaks or does something wrong or, or something like that, I can debug it and try to figure out what's going on. Right, you need to know that if I deploy this script out to two, two, three thousand machines, forty thousand, it doesn't matter. A lot of machines, I have a way of finding out if that script indeed worked, did what it was supposed to do, uh, and didn't cause adverse impact. So, log, log, log. Um, 
we basically, uh, I went through the trouble, so I'm like, you know, logging is really important. Uh, again, I'm lazy. Um, so I'm like, well, I don't want to have to, for every script I write, I don't want to have to build this logging framework and then have to utilize a logging framework. And then any time I make a change to this logging framework, I have to go to every Pringle, every script that I, I write and have to go change it. So what I did is I wrote a script called um, write log. Um, I thought it was going to be easy. <laughs> I'm like, writing logs, how hard could this be, right? So I started off with uh, just writing the text logs. That, I was right, was easy. Uh, when it started getting hard, it was like, oh, but we want to be able to roll those logs. Like, we want you to write the logs, but we don't want you to take too much disk space, right? And we want you to use multiple log files. And so now that I'm having, I'm like, all right, so now I got to write a, uh, a rolling mechanism. I'm like, that's not too hard. I can do that, no problem. So I did that, and they're like, now what we want, <laughs> this is what they do, right? Uh, they just put you in deeper and deeper. So then I'm like, uh, they're like, well, we want to be able to log um, to files. We, we want the rolling. We need to be able to roll. Uh, but we also want to be able to write to a, a vent log. Right? So they wanted to be able to say, you know, if you pass a flag, it'll write it to a text file, and it'll write it to Windows event log. Or you could do either one. So I'm like, okay, well, that's, that's pretty simple. Not, not a problem. I can add that. And then they're like, well, what if we want to syslog that data? What if I want to send that to a syslog? So they're like, now you need to implement syslog. <laughs> okay, now you're killing me. Uh, so I'm like, all right, well, I'll go through, and then I start looking at how I do it, QCP sockets and all that kind of good stuff. Anyway, we ended up creating um, the ability to syslog. And now they're like, well, it would be really cool. <laughs> I hate it when they start that sentence. It would be really cool if we could find out uh, if you could automatically discover where write log was called. So the idea is, is that if I wrote, if I did a write log in my script, right, it would know that the script name was this, and it would pre-tag that log message with the script name, which is fine, except they're like, but what if there's a function? Like, what if there's a function in that script that calls write log? So I had to go do this crazy, crazy pathing, basically dumping the call stack to find out where in the call stack I was to be able to stamp the, the function and or uh, the script name or wherever I was in, the, pa in the, the call stack so that I could stamp the appropriate you know, script name function and the, you know, kind of this is where I was at and then this is the message so that you could kind of backtrace in the log message where this data was coming from. Um, all of that was great, right? Um, and it worked. And they're like, can we just add this to a module? Right? So this, I said, all right, this does exactly what we want to do. Let's just add it to a module. Uh, and one of the things I, I think I get to in the next slide, if not, then I'll, I'll get to it in a second, is we had a company module. So we basically created a, a, a company-specific module that had com uh, functions that were company-specific that we would never share with anybody else. It was just all had to do with that stuff. I mean, even if another company used it, it wouldn't work because it had hard-coded stuff that you typically wouldn't hard-code in a module, right? So um, they're like, why don't we just add it to that? And I'm like, okay, well, we can do that. Well, it turns out um, that broke everything. Uh, and the reason why it broke everything is because when you load a module, a module has its own scope. Right, so when you have PowerShell and you have global scope and you load a module, there's a module run, basically it, it looks like script scope, uh, but it's basically running in its own scope. So that threw my whole PS, you know, getting my whole call stack out of whack because I was always getting into module scope. And if I would write something, the next time someone else wrote a log message, it would go into my log <laughs> because we were in the same scope. And I had created variables so that, um, like, if once you once you would set up the parameters for the, because I, I didn't want you to have to say, okay, every time you write a log message, you have to pass these 15 parameters so that you get the logging, the rolling, and all that kind of. I mean, I didn't want to do that. So the idea is, in the very beginning of the script, you would write, you call write log the very first time, and what write log would do is it would write, it would create a variable uh, in 
what was supposed to be global scope, <laughs> uh, and I learned, soon learned that that was not the case. So in global scope, that had all the parameters that were passed. And then any time write log would call, you know, would run, it would go see, do I have parameters already passed? Yes, I do, it would use those. So then all, once you did the initial setup of write log, all you had to do was say, write log message, write log message, write log message, and then kind of go through that whole thing. Uh, which all of that blew up in uh, module, and I fought with that for weeks, and I gave up. So if anyone wants to take that on, I'd love to, just for the sake of having it. Uh, anyway, uh, what we ended up doing was just throwing that all away uh, and using Splunk, <laughs> uh, which was that we just write to a log, uh, we just write to a local log file, uh, and we had uh, Splunk agents that would collect that log file and put it on a server and back. Anyway, all that to say, common log format is always nice to have. Uh, how many of you have looked at you know different logs and they've looked the same, right? If you go to Zenapp, look at the C, you know the CDMA tracing. Or if you go to uh, Zen Desktop and you look at their logs, or you go to like user ND logs, or you look at all the, none of them look the same, right? So every time you open up a new log file, what do you have to do? You have to figure out what the hell it says, right? You have to figure out what it's doing, what it says, how it works. Um, ideally, inside of your company, what you want to do is come up with a common log format that says, look, this is what our log messages look like. This is the date, this is the server name, this is the message. These are conventions of, like, you know, if we have event IDs, this is what we call event IDs, so that anybody that knows your company or, or knows the format that you've defined can open up a log file from any script and know immediately what's going on as opposed to trying to figure out, um, you know, what's going on. And the second thing is, is you gotta pop the developers in the head every single time they put debug type messages in a log file. No one knows what, you know, X5432741 means, right? Putting a memory address in a log file is useless. <laughs> and, and training your developers that that's useless is kind of hard to do, but um, something you might want to do. Uh, any questions before we go on? Okay. Um, so environment. <clears throat> so when it comes to building the environment, so this is the environment for the users that are writing script or that are using scripts and using PowerShell. Uh, we have basically two competing um, things, which is convenience versus performance. I can make something super convenient, which means that once they open up PowerShell, everything they could possibly want is there. They don't have to worry about adding anything, right? All the magic's done there. It looks exactly like they want it to look. It's got all the functions that they want to have. It's got all shortcuts, all the aliases, everything they want to have. Uh, and this works everywhere. It doesn't matter if I'm on PC1 or on PC2 or on PC3. It works everywhere, it's just magic, right? Uh, that is very convenient, but that has an adverse effect of not being very performant. And the reason why it's not very performant is because that profile, that user's PowerShell profile, for that to work properly has to be on a network share somewhere. Which means that every time that they launch PowerShell, they have to go basically run a PowerShell script over the network. Now, for most companies, internally, within your network, not a problem. Uh, now, if that happens to be in Mumbai, right, that could be a problem, right? If I'm loading my PowerShell, if I'm in uh, like San Francisco or whatever, and I'm loading my PowerShell profile in Mumbai, uh, there's probably gonna be a performance hit. Right. Speed of light is what the speed of light is. Anyway, so uh, these are two kind of competing things. Or I could have a very, very fast performance, like, man, every time I open my PowerShell prompt, it's like, bam, and there it is. But I have to load everything I want, right? I have to add all the modules that I want to do. I got to add all this, you know, all the aliases. I have to go through this whole process. So it, it's really a give and take on what you want to do and how much value you have, I mean, how much value you want to give the user, right? So um, we actually did put it on a network share. Uh, but we used DFSR to get it out to all the branch sites, and we had DFS in site flags. So the idea, the chances of you grabbing your uh, your profile from Mumbai were unlikely, especially since we didn't have an office in Mumbai. <laughs> but no, we actually did have an office in Mumbai. Uh, but the idea was is that we made it very unlikely that you would get your profile from a remote network. Um, the biggest problem I think we had were laptops. <laughs> Funny how those things work. They're not always connected. 
uh, we found that um, due to a quirk, um, and, and this is a very important quirk to know about, uh, which is why I bring it up. Um, if you happen to use um, uh, uh, an FQDN for your domain that is an actual valid FQDN on the internet, which is resolvable and pingable, um, if you try to use a DFS share to that, right, it will take 30 plus seconds for it to time out. That is not a wonderful user experience. <laughs> if I go to launch a script and my script just sits there and hangs for 30 seconds because it's trying to get to, and this is at home, like I'm at home and it's trying to get to, you know, uh, whack, whack, mydomain.com, whack, DFS share, right? Because you know mydomain.com is a valid domain, it sits there and hangs for 30 seconds. Now, if mydomain.com was not a valid domain, it would just like, whoop, nope, it's not there, I keep going, right? But because it's a valid domain, uh, and a lot of companies, and there's nothing wrong with doing this, a lot of companies do use valid AD DNS domains uh, for their Active Directory. Um, we found that uh, this is an extremely hard problem to solve. Because it, it's a it's a found it's a foundational problem with the .NET framework and the res, the way that DNS resolution works and the way that it resolves that host name. Um, we found that we actually had to do some kind of tricky uh, things to make it um, to work because uh, we couldn't we tried just pinging and that didn't work and then we were just trying to come up with some uh, pre a way for us to before we called the network share. We would do some kind of test to determine if the network is like, are we connected to our corporate network, or, or are we not connected to our corporate network? I mean, we could, you know, pick private IP addresses, but private IP addresses don't necessarily work because a lot of places may have. Anyway, the point of the story is is that um, when you're dealing with laptops, you do need. This is obviously something that you need to consider, right? Uh, is that they may not always be domain committed. Now, if you use direct access, it's probably less an issue. Um, but for everyone else in the world, the other 99.8% of the people <laughs> that don't use direct access, uh, this is a big problem that you need to be concerned about. So uh, back to the convenience versus perf. Um, we, we chose to go, obviously, with a more convenient thing. Uh, we had follow me profile, which is basically every user had a profile. Uh, so the way that we did it is um, on every machine, uh, we had... Uh, a folder, a, a local script repository that was on that machine that had a profile called uh, you know, default profile.ps1. And the, uh, the PowerShell default profile, so the profile that PS1 in power, uh, PS home, uh, profile.ps1 would always, would basically just dot source that script. And then in that script, we would build in logic to find the user's profile. Uh, and we use the username to do that. Does that make sense? Um, and uh, admin profiles, uh, because our, our typical process is for admins, you would have um, you know username underscore admin. So we just would also when we went through the, the the profile detection process or trying to figure out who the user was, we would say, okay, well if the user is an admin, because you can determine from the the shell if it was an admin or not then uh, go get the profile with underscore admin. Uh, so we back in this, <coughs> so back in this, uh, this path right here, uh, a user could have two profiles. One would be, you know, my, uh, my user dot PS1, uh, and then my user underscore admin PS1. And then the user would have the right through SVN to modify that profile to do whatever they wanted to do. Uh, we found that this this one thing alone uh, significantly increased our users' um, usage. Um, ideally, what we would do is, and, and a lot of times we would say, uh, like if they wanted to, use, we had like I had a I had a customs and desktop module that I wrote. I had a customs and app module I did that would kind of add some functionality that were company specific. Um, but they don't, I mean, the idea is that you don't want to sit there and fumble on username, passwords, and all that stuff, so we could use secure string. Ideally, what I did is I showed them, I would have like example wikis on, this is how you create a profile so that you can auto log into your Zen app stuff. This is how you do your Zen desktop stuff. So they would just go do the work one time. And these, like I said, these guys were, you know, smarter than the average bear. 
in, in that regard. So th they were perfectly acceptable going to a wiki page, figuring out what they were supposed to do, do it one time, and then magic would happen. And every time they opened up PowerShell, they would be get everything they wanted to have, right? Um, any questions about so? Uh, like I said, this is probably the most. Um, this is one of the fundamental things that we did that uh, increased adoption, at least within the help desk. Um, out of all our customer, out of all the stuff we did, this probably had the biggest impact. Uh, to the point where we had a lot of users. Uh, and granted, our, our users were not your typical users either, um, but we had a lot of users that were using PowerShell because it was easy for them to do stuff. Like we wrote um, scripts to dial. Like so, they could just go to the, they could have a PowerShell prompt up, and if they wanted to call somebody, they could just dial, say you know dial you know five six seven one enter, and their phone would automatically ring. And that you know the stuff that just makes it easier for them instead of having to worry to reach over here you know and dial an extension and having to worry about the headset on. They could just like press dial, keep on doing what they're doing, and if it doesn't hang it, I mean, they had a whole kind of gamut of things that they could do. Um, again, they weren't using PowerShell, but they were using PowerShell. Right? And that's the idea, is that you want to get them the power and the usefulness of PowerShell without having to know PowerShell. Anything on the profiles? Nope. <coughs> modules. Um, everyone knows what a module is, right? should probably preface that. So modules, uh, in this case, what we did is we had uh, a module repository. Um, in this module repository, we had third-party modules. Um, so a third-party module would be like this, like uh, I would get the Zen app stuff, extract the DLLs, make a module out of it, and put that up there so they didn't have to have Snap and loaded on every place that they went to. Did the same thing with Zen Desktop. Um, a, a lot of companies, uh, VMware, uh, Hyper-V, we had modules for each one of those platforms in our third-party module thing. So that most people could just, uh, and we also added, oh, the other thing back here. Um, so not only did we create these uh, central repositories, but we added these central repositories to the default profile. So uh, in PowerShell, there's a, a variable called PS module path, uh, which is a, a, a basically a semicolon delimited list of paths that PowerShell will try to go look for modules in, right? So what we did is when we created uh, this path right here for modules, we added that to um, our module path. So as long as a module was located in that path, they could just say import module and not have to worry about where it was located. Does that make sense? Uh, and we also did the same thing with scripts. So they didn't have to worry about you know finding the lo location of scripts. We added the domain PowerShell scripts um, path to their, their, uh, their basically their, I don't know why the word has escaped me. Um, and, and, and you have a path that will tell you, you know, where to command lookup, where to look stuff up. Um, if you add this, if you add a script path to there, then you can just type the script name and press enter and PowerShell will figure out this is in my path and run the script. Um, I recommend that all companies, um, uh, use, uh, create at least a single custom. You might find yourself, um, I, I do know of some larger, so we had about, I don't know, 3,000 people in our company. Um, not extremely large, uh, but it's not a small company either. Uh, but I do know like larger, you know, 250,000 plus uh, type companies, right? Uh, in our case, a single company module was enough. Uh, for the larger companies that have 250,000 plus users, uh, they I've found that those companies tend to have more custom modules. So they'll have very specific, this is our Landesk module, this is our Hyper-V module, this is our VMware module. And they would take third party, uh, third party modules and basically build company versions of those um, modules so that they could, if there was a <coughs> command that they like, so get VM, uh, or like if I want to do get VM and instead of passing uh, a machine name, I wanted to create a get VM and be able to type a username, right? So that's not there in the default behavior. So I can write a, I can write a commandlet or write a function um, that does username and then does all the lookup and magic in the background. Uh, but the user doesn't need to know that's happening, right? The user just knows, oh, if I want to find a user's VM, I just type get VM and username and boom, magic happens, right? 
which is exactly what you want, right? You don't want them to, you don't want them to figure, you don't want them to know. I mean, if they want to learn, they can learn it. But the idea is that you want to make it as simple, as straightforward as possible, without them having to know a bunch of information to get that data. Okay. Any questions on modules? Do you, any of you all use? Do, I, I should have asked this earlier. How many? Do you, any of you all have like a PowerShell platform, for lack of a better term, at work, where you use you have PowerShell like built into your your workflow and stuff like that? Nobody. Hopefully that'll change. It was all because you didn't know what you were doing before. Now you know, so now you have to have it. Um, do you, any of you all have custom company modules or modules that you've written specifically for your company? No? Sad, sad. Soon. <clears throat> so before I go into this, there are any questions? So that was all kind of like uh, the, the data stuff. What I wanted to show you here is I wanted to kind of go through what we did uh, to get all the PowerShell stuff together and what we did with all this stuff that we did. That was a lot of dids in one sentence. Um, so <clears throat> we were rolling out Windows 7. Um, so that was my, uh, when I first started my company, my job was to, uh, even though I was a server guy, which was kind of weird, um, was to roll out the Windows 7 uh, rollout, going from XP to Windows 7. Not only that we were going from XP to Windows 7, we were going from 32-bit to 64-bit. It's like, hey, if we're going to do it, let's just bite the bullet. Let's go to 64-bit, Windows 7, never look back. Uh, let's not do this 32-bit business. Um, anyway, as we were going through this process, the fact that we went to 64-bit, obviously, as you can imagine, caused all kinds of wonderful issues, um, primarily around some of the platforms that we used to manage the boxes before. Right? So if you have desktops or servers, Right, you have to have a way of managing these servers. Uh, and the way that most people do this is they use, they'll have like Landesk or SMS or FCOM or SSCM or whatever it's called these days. Um, they have all these products that they use to kind of do these things, right? To, to like if I want to, you know, create a text file on all my machines, I would have some process for doing so. Uh, we had a custom written process that we used in XP. Uh, when we were going to Windows 7, it was determined that that process was no longer going to work. It is not going to do what we wanted to do. So one of the first things we had to figure out was a job manager. How do I get stuff to happen on all my 3,000 desktops without having to send uh, a systack out to every machine to, to do whatever functionality we wanted to do? Um, so basically what we decided to do was to create a, power, a job manager in PowerShell uh, using... Uh, Task Manager. Have, have, have any of y'all used Task Manager in Windows 7? It's astronomically useful, right? <laughs> it is not the uh, Task Manager from XP, right? It is very, very powerful. It's very, very resilient. It's very reliable. Uh, and it's, insa it's insane in the amount of stuff that you can do. They invested a lot of, this actually was done in Vista, but no people, but people pretend like Vista never existed. Uh, but the, the event, the, the uh, Task Manager, uh, and Windows 7 was insane, insanely useful. So we're like, so we have this really useful task manager, right? We have a couple of guys from really good PowerShell skills. So what we decided to do is like, let's use um, task manager and PowerShell to create our own job manager. So what we did is we used, uh, we used uh, the task scheduler. So we created one, it was all basically based off of one script uh, that we called you know, our scheduler, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we had a fancy name for it, but can't share that with you. But call it my task scheduler, right, dot PS1. And what this is, is we, the, what we did is we built this into every machine, and we, we, we had it to where it every hour that script would run. And what that script would do, it, was a, it would check, it would do a SQL query to get an XML task definition, all the XML task definitions for that machine, so it would run on a machine. It's like, okay, this is my machine name. Uh, it would do a query against SQL, say, hey, do I have any jobs waiting for me to do? If there was a job, the job would be stored in a task scheduler XML format. So to create a job, we would just go into task scheduler, create all the parameters we want to do, and then say export to XML, and then import that XML into SQL. Does that make sense? <coughs> Uh, then that so that process that script would run every hour 
and then go look uh, in SQL for any kind of jobs that need to be done, put them in there, schedule them, whatever the schedule is, uh, and then kind of go on its merry way. Uh, we had history and all that kind of good stuff. We did a lot of, a lot of work there. Uh, but the, it was basically just XML and SQL. It was uh, really useful. Uh, we could do, um, typically it, would, it wouldn't take us more than an, uh, an hour to push a job out. So uh, if, if needed be, we could always increase the frequency of the, uh, because the, uh, the, j the script that was responsible for getting the jobs from SQL uh, was also a task itself. Right? <laughs> Uh, so it was kind of like you just have to run the script one time and you could do it from a network share. And then once you did it from the network share, it would actually go get the script from SQL, stamp it in there, and then run it at whatever cycle. And then it was like part of the whole process. Um, <coughs> uh, we also needed, are, are you all familiar with Puppet or Chef? No? no. Uh, so Puppet is, I, I didn't know if that was a joke or not. <laughs> so uh, what Puppet is, is, um, it's basically a, like a, a file configuration. It's, it's for Linux, typically, or Unix environments, where you want to sync config between multiple machines. So basically, like, I, these are the text files I have here. I want these text files here, right? So there was just like this whole mechanism, uh, puppet mechanism for getting uh, those config files from one machine to another and being in sync and making sure that when one was changed, that the other one would be changed, that kind of stuff, right? Um, well, from a from an OS perspective, that's not as important in Windows, right? Because we have that horrible thing called a registry. registry. God, for config files, I would die. Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> for the stuff that we wrote and a lot of other co uh, products wrote, they would have config files. So for those config files, we needed to have Puppet-like functionality. So what we did is I created a script called Invoke File Sync. Um, that would go out to a network share, it would grab a JSON file, and that JSON file would tell uh, that machine what files do I need to go sync from a network share. Again, and because we were using SVN, everything in that network share was all SVN, uh, so that we, we knew that we were getting out what we wanted to get. And this was also part of the job. So we had a job that said call invoke file sync every X amount of days or hours or whatever we wanted it to do. And then that would go connect to the network share. It would say, go through um, the JSON, try to figure out, you know, these are the files or folders that I need to sync. And, you know, basically it was just a robocopy. It really was just a robocopy wrapper, my invoke file sync. I started to do it like, oh, you know, I'm a PowerShell guy. I got to write this in PowerShell. I cannot use third party tools. I got to do this right. Uh, and then I realized that was a lot of work. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm going to use robocopy. <laughs> It's something that's there everywhere. That's the way to do it. So uh, basically, my invoke file sync started off like this, and then it came down to just basically being a RoboCopy wrapper. But the thing, it worked so much better uh, than me having to worry about all that kind of stuff. Uh, so we would use this to sync config files, modules, and scripts. Um, so back to the laptop scenario where we had uh, the situation where we had laptops that uh, were offline. Um, we wanted them to be able to use certain modules that would makes sense offline. So the way that we would do that is we, there was in the file sync, there were certain modules and scripts where we would determine these are, they need to be highly available, they need to be replicated down. So on every machine, we had a folder called C, I, I don't remember what it's called, but we'll say C data, right? C data, and under C data, there was a folder called logs, there's a folder called modules, there's a folder called scripts. Uh, and what would happen is the invoke file sync would say, uh, these are the scripts you need to have. It would put in my scripts folder. These are the modules you have to have. These are adding your modules folder. These are the, you know, and just kind of do this whole thing. And the default uh, profile was also one of these things. So that we could change the default profile in one location, and then after the next file sync, everyone would have the new profile. Anyway, so <coughs> we basically used uh, the job manager to create that invoke file sync that would get that data out to the uh, end users. Uh, and then any modules that we wanted to run locally, performance reason, we did have a few that had binary files. We didn't want to reload those over the wire, so we actually would sync those down. Any questions? Uh, the other thing that we did, um, again, I'm a Splunk guy. Uh, I started uh, prior to working for Splunk. I actually worked at this company that we use Splunk. Uh, we would do script analytics because 
One of the problems that you have, right, especially when you're doing this scripting on, you know, 3,000 desktops, uh, is what broke when and why and how, right, and how often and all that kind of stuff. So there was a lot of analytics uh, that we needed to have in regards to trying to figure out, oh, so we just submitted this new job. Since we submitted this new job, how many machines have picked up the job? Right, how many machines are utilizing, or, or how many error, you know, how many machines are throwing errors, that kind of stuff. So we created, uh, uh, I created a dashboard, uh, I, which I can show you. I, I can't show you the one that we had, which was much, much fancier than what I uh, what I designed uh, on the airplane coming here. <laughs> but uh, it, it's very similar in regards to showing you uh, what you can do as far as the script analytics are concerned. So just to kind of give you, um, before we go into the script analytics stuff, uh, just to kind of give you an idea of what um, it looked like. Uh, so uh, on our desktops, laptops, we had a folder called C data. It had scripts, modules, profiles, and then, then are for stuff like RoboCopy or Grep or Asset or Auk or anything that we would uh, would be we would consider part of our process that we would always want to have on all our desktops. We would put that in then. All of those would be replicated using Evoke File Sync. Uh, then we would use a scheduled task, uh, invoke file sync would be one of those, and then get my job, which would be the SQL that would go and use query SQL say. Uh, and we actually implemented um, uh, 80 groups and WMI uh, queries. So you could actually run a WMI query, and if that WMI query returned true, then you were supposed to get this job. If not, then you weren't supposed to get that job. That kind of good stuff. Uh, and I already told you about invoke file sync. Uh, we used a JSON and network share. And all of this stuff, like I said, was the sort in the main PowerShell with scripts, modules, then. Uh, we actually had a profiles folder too uh, that was also in SQL. <coughs> uh, so all of that stuff was there. Any questions on this? A and this is not, I mean, the job engine, that's a <laughs> that is a lot of work. That's not something I say, hey, you should go do that tomorrow. Um, it's, don't come back to Brightform, go back to work and create a a job manager. Uh, no, it's actually really useful if, if you're in that market. Uh, so a lot of, if you've already bought something, obviously then you know, heck, use whatever you bought. Uh, but if you haven't, uh, it's really useful, something that you can do. Uh, and there's some really useful um, things that you can do along that line. Task, using task scheduler is, um, of course this also presumes that you're only Windows 7. Uh, are y'all all using Windows 7 or are you still on XP? No, you XP? I'm sorry. Let that thing die. I cannot believe in today's society, with the way that IT this goes from one thing to the, that we're still using it. It's still a 12-year-old OS. Oh my God, let it die. Uh, anyway, <laughs> you know it's going to be like an old, decrepit, you know, 2020. You're still going to use an XP. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. Uh, anyway, so if you you have the luxury of using Windows 7, that's that's kind of the, the caveat, right? So. Uh, the PowerShell stuff is not an issue because that's backwards compatible. You can go all the way back to XP with that. Uh, it is an issue for Task Manager or Scheduler because that doesn't exist in XP. Um, are any of y'all in the midst of doing a migration to Windows 7? Are y'all yours like screw it? We don't. Want, we're waiting for Windows 8. We want that Metro. <laughs> Woo! Sometimes I wonder what the guys at Microsoft smoke. I really do. <laughs> what they smoke, uh, I, they their ideas. I, I don't. I mean, so Metro is cool, but I mean that's you just made an astronomical leap uh, in you know going from XP to Windows Seven to try to make another leap like that within two years when you have a very small uptake to Windows Seven anyway, or we have a large uptake to Windows Seven, but there's still people doing that. I don't know. <laughs> Trying to be the iPad. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> so, um, so the script analytics, uh, basically it'll give you uh, an, an example that I have, uh, it gives you an overview of the environment, uh, it'll show you how many computers, servers are running scripts, uh, how many scripts are running, how many different types of scripts, how many failures, uh, and then you can visualize the impact of that um, by seeing the events over time, uh, how many servers are failing, and how many scripts are failing. Uh, like I said, it, and, and this, uh, to be honest with you, all, all I did to make this work, um, 
and you can do this, this doesn't cost you any money. You can get the free version of Splunk to do this, right? You don't have to have, there's nothing here that requires the paid version of Splunk. So, um, and all I did was just send all my log files to, all my script, my script log files to, to Splunk and I was able to get all this. And this dashboard literally took me probably 10 minutes to write. Uh, granted, I'm you know a little bit more Splunky than most people. <laughs> uh, but the point is, is that it's a, it's a pretty uh, easy thing to achieve. Fifteen minutes, I guess. Oh, like where is it? It's over here. So I mean, this is just kind of what I did um, on the, on the airplane. Uh, this will show you the script chat. So it's a hundred computers that I that I'm getting data from. Uh, just seven different scripts that I've run. Uh, <laughs> I apparently don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Pretend like that says ten. So a thousand errors uh, in the last. Uh, now, so this is time based. So in this particular case, uh, this is uh, in the last one. <laughs> Great, last 24 hours. No, actually, no. This is actually data gens, fake data. Uh, that's what I'm going to say. My scripts actually don't error that much. So uh, anyway, so this will that'll tell you like the overview of errors and users and all that kind of uh, computers. Uh, you could add users on here too, so if you wanted to add that. This will be like the top computers with errors. Um, so you can see this guy, uh, this guy right here seems to be having a lot of errors. Um, approximately 2% of the entire error population. Um, so these are your top scripts with errors. So you can see that in this case, uh, invoke file sync, see, well-written script and only errored 125 times. Um, but you know, get local user seems to be the, the biggest problem. You could also spot situations with this, and, and we've, we've actually had this happen where um, uh, AD authentication fell, failed, or, or was failing. Uh, and then you would see down here, you'd see this huge spike in failures. And, and, you're, and you're like, uh, well, when did that failure start? Well, this is when the spike started, so let's find out what, let's go look at that time period. And sure enough, you could see that the AD domain controllers were down. And the only scripts that were failing were ones that used AD authentication. So it's going like, uh, you know, one and one is five. Uh, you can also see events by type, obviously, in this particular case. While I do have a lot of errors, info is my highest quantity. So that's good, right? Um, down here, this is your kind of uh, a visual of how many different error warnings and information that you have over time. So in this case, uh, error, uh, information seems to be my high ones. We seem to be pretty consistent, um, and we can change this uh, over time. I can go up here and I say, you know, I just want to see it for like the last uh, four hours. Is that one? And then it'll give me data for just that four hours, right? So obviously, in this, in the last four hours, uh, I had a little spikage here of problems. Uh, anyway, I don't want to bore y'all with Splunk, but um, if you want to get bored with Splunk, you can come by and I'll give you the booth and give you shirts and stuff. But anyway, um, I just want to show you uh, what you could do as far as the, the PowerShell project, be able to get all the logs. Touchdown! No, <laughs> uh, 10 minutes. That's good because I wanted questions and answers. So um, I can just leave that here. Any questions? So y'all are just... No, I did such a good job of explaining. There's no questions. Yes. No. No. I mean everything I do. No, no, no. no. The, the, the script they executed, or is it just a, um, you know, a, a task on the client which is um, asking for files and you know the jobs, or is it uh, some some kind of central management engine which is inv invoking everything? So we were only using it for clients initially, right? Mm -hmm. Because our Windows 7 rollout was far, far more advanced than our 2008 R2 mm -hmm. rollout, right? So we were doing a 2008 R2. So uh, granted, remember everything we were built was built off a of task scheduler, right? Okay. So task scheduler wasn't introduced until 2008, mm -hmm. as far as the server plot. I mean, there was task scheduler in Windows 2003, but not really, right? Okay. <laughs> there was a joke in 2003. <laughs> uh, the punchline was actually in 2008 R2. But so um, as we were rolling out 2008 R2, we were implementing a lot of what we were doing on the desktop on the servers. 
but we didn't really take in a whole initiative on the servers because we didn't have, uh, servers are far, believe it or not, are actually far more complicated to upgrade in our particular environment than it was to desktop. Mm -hmm. So our Windows 2008 process was much slower. Okay, thank you. But there was nothing, there's nothing about what I did that would you know, preclude you from doing servers. Mm -hmm. There's nothing client-y about it, per se. This is what we used it for. Okay. Anyone else? Yes. Yes. Uh, um, right now, we saw you had the, the whole profiles and scripts on the network shares and things. How do you secure those scripts and profiles and all this stuff? Are we normally entering test groups or memberships or something like that? I think we have to help this user to maybe we should use that and everything. But not every user everywhere or something like that. Or how you secure that? I mean, if somebody knows the script. Well, so what, the way that we did it is that the, the only people that could write yeah, to that right share. Is, yeah, of course. Right. right. The yeah. only one that could write to those shares were uh, domain admins. Mm -hmm. uh, and domain users had read. Right. But only read. They couldn't write. Um, and and the, the kind of the attitude from our perspective there uh, was it's internal. We didn't care. Like if, if someone had walked into the company and looked at one of our scripts, um, it wasn't a concern okay. for us. Um, now, because um, we had really we had really tight, like to get in the building, you, you like have to shoot somebody, right? So okay. <laughs> lots of somebody. But uh, generally speaking, it was, it was a pretty high security from the outside of the building. Um, but I could see uh, what you don't want to do is if you don't secure it is put passwords and stuff. Yeah, that's like right. That, yes. Uh, <laughs> we, we didn't typically do that. What we did in, uh, with like profiles and stuff like that to allow people to kind of get the auto log on, uh, I had wrote scripts to import and export credentials to text files uh, that was stored with secure string, uh, which means that the only person that could decrypt that string was that user on the specific machine that they encrypted it on. So uh, that was considered acceptable. So if you wanted to auto log on, we would say, well, the way that you would do the auto log, log on is that you would use put this in your profile, where it would import that credentials from the network using your syskey, effectively. Make sense? Yeah. 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 Anyone else? You have a question? No. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I was like, huh? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> no questions. No questions, really. All right, um, I guess we have five minutes to hang out. We have five minutes to fill out evaluation forms, because that's exciting. Are you sure you don't have any questions? No. I'll be here if you have any. <laughs>